think I've confessed to you before that I miss about serving as a as a pastor, a teaching pastor, lead pastor, is uh, having a platform to address the sort of the lunacy that is going on in, in our world. And it takes all shapes and sizes, but I can't think of anything that's more perplexing or mind-boggling than the, the politics of our own nation. It was two years ago in May when, in an interview, then a candidate Joe Biden made this statement. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm not black. But I can easily see why that would be an insult to those people who are. And one of my perplexity is why it does not seem to be the case. And then you have um, the case of Katanji Jackson Brown, who sat through hearings for Supreme Court justice, in which she was asked point blank, can you define what it is to be a woman? <laughs> and unlike, you know, some who would say yes or no, she, she, said, she said no with a qualifier. I'm not qualified. That um, is a perplexity. Did that mean she did not know, or did that mean that it was not politic, politically expedient for her to state a position on what that meant? because it was a, a question within the framework of the conflict that we currently now have over the issue of, quote, trans. And I spoke to that a couple of weeks ago. It, it, it just drives me nuts, the people that want to embrace that kind of thinking. You know, I have wondered all along that I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in states' rights. And I would be okay if a state in the union says, we're for everything, you know, come here. And let all the people who are of that persuasion or the lack of any persuasion go there and enjoy each other's insanity. It only, it only makes sense to me. And unless there is a, you know, the simple answer to the, the tension of the conflict between gender that is spawn this whole debate about the participation of athletes that are gender confused. It, it's really quite simple. It's either A, let's eliminate all categories of gender in terms of events, activities, participation, and say it's a level playing field for everyone. There will not be men's sports and women's sports. There will simply be sports. And everybody competes in the same arena. That seems like it makes it fair to everyone. And yet, the very ones who are proposing an alternative to the black and white of male and female would say, well, that's not fair. Oh, really? Or the other option is, for all those people in the gender-confused category, let them create a league for themselves. Let the men compete with the men. Let the women compete with the, the women. Let the confused Complete, compete with the, the confused. Let them get their own sponsors. Let them raise their own money. Let them, you know, on and on and on. And, but nobody's buying that because, frankly, I think it makes too much sense. Now, it's probably not PC for preachers to be addressing these kind of things, but you can understand when this kind of lunacy is going on uh, uh, all around us that men who have the opportunity to stand in platforms in public and, and open the Word of God and preach you know, they can't help avoid addressing these things because they are within the framework of what the Bible says is right and wrong, good and evil, moral and immoral. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I, I miss being able to address is the, the historic rulings by the Supreme Court. Now, it's sort of interesting. This doesn't prove a point anything, but when you, you query, I was looking for some images, and so when you Google Supreme Court, this is what you're likely to get. The picture of a building. <laughs> Evidently, um, 
the people who program the respondents on online are a little confused themselves. This is not the Supreme Court. It is the Supreme Court building. This is the Supreme Court, made up of nine justices. Sometimes I think that might be an oxymoron. Sometimes it's judges and injustices. And the scary thing is that, uh, you know, Jackson Brown, the hearing that she sat through that could not define what a woman was, it was to set on this court, the quote, highest court of the land. And to not have a platform to celebrate with millions and hundreds of millions of others about the sanctity of, of human life and their ruling to reverse uh, Roe v. Wade. And then to, to hear the reactions to that from politicians calling that group a, a, a Taliban and a call for impeaching them because, they, you know, it, it just, it, it's part of the perplexity that I have that here the, the rules of engagement are established historically, the practices. And, and it's worked for, you know, over 200 years. And it would look like those who have been participants in this for that long in whatever per political persuasion they're in have figured out if, if you can't win by the rules, then let's just change the rules. And when you do that, frankly, you have no rules. So it's all within that framework of while I'm, I'm doing interviews which are critically important and and I, I thoroughly enjoy that. And the young man that I was with last week, Josh McClendon, was a real pleasure and a joy for, for me to be able to do that. And, uh, and all of these young men that I've been interviewing, they've got me rethinking some of my strategies about assisting and helping churches within the framework of culture where we are. So all of this stuff is going on, and I'm engaged in trying to do this. That I, I'm still doing my own personal daily devotion time. Get up in the morning. Uh, some of you may have, have seen the Facebook post that I borrowed from somebody else and put it on, on my personal page about, you know, there's nothing better in the morning than the smell of, of brewed coffee and then the sound of silence without anybody talking to me while I enjoy it. The, the only thing it didn't say, while I enjoy it, while I'm, I'm reading scripture and spending time with God. That, that is me. That's what I want my morning to be. And so while all this stuff was unfolding with the Supreme Court and what's taking place around the country, I'm reading in, I'm reading in, in 2 Samuel. And I think it was probably uh, Tuesday a week ago when I was in chapters 11 and 12. And I came away, I've read this a hundred times before. I'm, I'm sure that I've preached on portions of it, but I've not preached on the whole of it. That as I read this account, that we are not going to attempt to, to read all of it. We're going to simply read an introductory verse and then a concluding verse to set the framework for our subject today, and, it's, and we're simply entitling this Perplexed by Grace. I confess I'm perplexed by a lot of things, both in a non-believing world um, in an unholy political environment. Uh, I, I'm perplexed about the fact that I, I can be thankful that John, Donald Trump was the one who nominated uh, so many Supreme Court justices who, who share a, a set of values sim similar to most of us that have ended up in the rulings that we've seen. Late. I'm, but, but for Trump to be such a uh, and in great when it comes to the people around him that however much fraud there may have taken place in the last election, he lost it because he made more enemies than he really needed to have. And he continues to do so. I'm grateful for his choices of Supreme Court nominations. I'm not grateful for how he's conducted himself to create a problem that did not have to exist otherwise. I'm perplexed by believers who, who have a, a moving standard of what is right and wrong and I'm going to have to come back to that in some later date because that, that has my mind spinning. And uh, I'm going to make it, it's going to make it a little confusing for everybody. But when I read this passage in 2 Samuel, this is where I came away with. And I wanted to talk about this perplexity of grace as we share this passage. So if you have a Bible or electronic device and you want to pick that up and read this, and, and don't start reading the rest of the passage while I'm doing my thing here. I'll encourage you to go back afterwards and read the entirety of it, but we're going to we're going to summarize what takes place there in the interest of time. So so reading in 2 Samuel chapter 11 
and verse 1. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they brought destruction on the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. Now those of you that are familiar with Old Testament history, you're familiar with the name David, you're familiar with his position that he became king, you're familiar with the fact that he became the second regent that Israel had after they rejected um, God's system of having judges and prophets provide leadership for them. They said, give us a king. And you're familiar with the story that God provided Saul, who started off on a good foot, but then he became so self-absorbed in his own sense of authority and importance and value that uh, he disobeyed God and, and essentially not only lost the throne, but his descendants as well. And, and, and the whole story, of course, while I was reading this, that um, I, it put in mind that I'm, I'm fully persuaded that most, if not all, of the works of Shakespeare were influenced by his reading, his reading scripture. That um, the stories and the twists and the turns and the lives of people there is just so good. And then you go and you, you, you read or you listen to Shakespearean stuff and you're going, this has a familiar feel to it. And I think that's the reason. I have nothing to back that up other than it's just a sense. Because it's part of that intrigue that, that here, you know, Saul has, um, has an opportunity to do something great in serving God. And he did serve some useful purposes and provided protection, um, you know, waging war, structure and order in Israel at that time. And that he enlisted the aid of a, of a young man to come in as a musician into his court. So when he was having a problem and needed to mellow out and think that he wanted a musician, and who was that young man? It was David. Shepherd boy from a big family who, who came and stayed with Saul. So he's in that context when Saul has the throne taken away from him by the Lord. And David is raised up in that very complex arrangement where Saul, you know, David goes out. Uh, Saul is immobilized by fear when Goliath comes out by the Philistines and, and, and challenges Israel. Israel is in a slave state. They, they, they only have like two or three swords. Saul has a sword and his son Jonathan has a sword and nobody else has a sword. They have pitchforks and they have farm implements, but that's it. They, they are weaponless. And, you know, we have an event where, where the son Jonathan is used of God to, to bring deliverance at a period. Well, we fast forward and hear it again. You have Israel that sort of hunkered down. Saul, who is immobilized by fear and uncertainty, and you have Goliath marching out into the middle of a valley and to say, you know, let's do man on man here. And, and the winner takes all. And nobody was willing to take him up. And in one of those treks from, from home to, uh, to Jerusalem, where, where Saul was and, and David was sent there by his dad to take food for his brothers who were serving in the army, that, that David saw the, the curses and the challenges of this giant of a man in, uh, in Goliath and said, don't worry about it. I'm willing to take him on. I know I'm a runt. I know I'm just a shepherd boy. I do have some experience with big bass beasts like bears and lion, and none have taken my sheep. And 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 you know the story. Uh, he is sent out. He picks up some smooth stones. He 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 does not accept armor to take out with him. He picks up you know some rocks and his slingshot and goes out there and Goliath is, is swearing at him and swearing at his God and making fun of him and everything and, 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 and David simply puts a sling in that slingshot, whirls it around his head and lets go and it nails Goliath right in the forehead. He falls down and because David wants to make sure that he is dead, not just suffering from a severe concussion and headache, he, he takes the Goliath sword and chops his head off. And then the battle is engaged. And it was after that that, that David garnered a reputation in all of Israel as a great man of war. And so when he would come back from battle, 
uh, the, the young women who were smitten with this young boy, they would talk about Saul slaying his thousands, but David had slain his ten thousands. And so in Saul's mind, David became the enemy even with his own household. Fast forward, uh, Saul and Jonathan finally die in battle to the Philistines. David has been running for his life because Saul put a price on his head because he thought David was a threat. Again, there's too much history that you need to be reading and go back and get all those details of those journeys. But eventually, David is anointed and elevated to the position of king. And all is well. The Bible says about him what it says about no one else that God says that David was a man after my own heart. And he will always have the descendant to sit on the throne. And you read all that and you see the exploits of David and, and, and you marvel at that. And, and, and we read many of the Psalms were penned by him because he was a musician. Uh, he, I don't know that he wrote any music, but he certainly had music in his heart. He could play a, a harp or some sort of a stringed instrument. So he was a multi-talented, multi-gifted, very good-looking young man who was gifted and skilled and blessed of God. And God brought peace to Israel during this, this reign of David for so many years. He vanquished all his enemies. They prospered and things were doing well. David is the one who, who got the idea. that he, he built a really nice house for himself. And uh, he got concerned because the, the tabernacle was the place, the dwelling place of the ark of God. And he wanted to, do some, he wanted to go into a massive building program to, to build a great place for the ark of the covenant. And, and God said to him, no, you're not the one to do it. You, you've got too much blood on your hands through the course of your, your life and your service. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let your son do that. So we come here to, to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And, and the language is very interesting, but it's very simple. Then it happened in the spring. Uh, nothing magic about that. It, there's no exact timeline given to this other than to say that uh, battles and wars were fought generally during the times of the year when it was more conducive to being outside to do that. And apparently there was, it, it was just simply the way life was. Then in the spring is when the engagement took place. And, and David, who had done so, so during the course of his reign up to this time, and even before he became king, he was the one leading the, 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 the army out into the field to fight the battles of the enemies of Israel. But it says it happened in, in that year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that for the first time in his career, for the first time in his reign, he didn't go. He sent Joab his servant, and they succeeded. They brought destruction on the sons of Ammon, and they besieged Rabah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. I, I don't know. I've heard pastors make more out of that and say that you know, D David shouldn't have been at home. He should have stayed. He should have gone out in the field. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't think that's the point that the, the biblical writer is making here. The point is what happened as a result of David staying at home. Now, let's fast forward and read the end of, of sort of this account this, uh, that I'm perplexed by grace in to sort of set the stage or, on, on why <laughs> I'm framing this as I am, and I think you'll appreciate it. If you turn to 2 Samuel um, chapter 12, you read in verse 24, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and slept with her. And she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. The him, the pronoun him in that verse is, and the Lord loved Solomon. You say, so what's, what's the big deal? You have David staying at home when the armies go out to battle at the beginning of chapter 11. And here late in chapter 24, you have David going in to comfort his wife. And, 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 and they engage physically and she conceives and has a son and that son is born and and David gives him a name of Solomon, and the commentary says, And the Lord loved Solomon. The perplexity of grace, and for those of you who know this account, you understand this perplexity. I don't know how much time you have spent studying these events or thinking about these events, but they are a grand mystery to me, and I've been <laughs> studying it for a long time.
So the account, as you read in the passage after verse 1 in chapter 11, where it says, and, and David didn't go out to battle with everyone else. And immediately after it says he was up on the, the, the roof of the palace. You know, the buildings and the structures in those days. And, and many of those places still today, the, the structures have a flat roof on them. They're not, they're not pitched. And, and it was an area that you could go up on and you could spend time. Quite often there'd be a structure up there because historically, uh, before there was such thing as air conditioning, during the heat of summer, you could go up on the roof in the shade and kind of get a breeze and have some, some relief up there. So David was simply on the roof of the palace walking around and looking. And looking over the side of the palace, he looked down into the courtyard of one of the local residences and there was a woman who was at home taking a bath. And David didn't turn and walk away with some sense of shame or embarrassment, um, some, some form of, of dignity. He kept looking and he kept watching. Now remember this is a man who God says is after my own heart. And David looked long enough until lust crept into his spirit, lust crept into his mind, lust crept into his heart, and he became overcome with the passion and desire to have that woman who just happened to be married. And her husband just happened to be Uriah the Hittite who was out engaged with the army while David was staying home. And so what does David do? He sends messengers to go to the house of Bathsheba and to say, the king would like to see you. Nobody refused the request of the king. She came to the palace. She came up to his, his rooms. He sent everybody else out. And we don't know what the engagement was other than David, whether a, a seduction whether there was willing cooperation, whether Bathsheba tried to present resistance and say, King, you, you really shouldn't do this. I'm a married woman. You're a married man. You're a godly man. You're the king. You shouldn't do this. We don't have any of that information other than it says that David had his way with her. And what we know about ancient history, that was not uncommon. The king was the final authority. He was the supreme court, at least in his mind, in terms of what he did. As long as it was not against the law, he was the law. And it says that she, she gathered herself, she went home, and it wasn't long. I'm thinking it's a matter of weeks now. I understand that for some of you dear ladies that uh, when you got married, some of you knew the next day when you had conceived because your body immediately told you that. Some, it's a matter of weeks. For some, it's a matter of months. Uh, but we know that in a, in a short time frame, Bathsheba realized that she was expecting a child. She could do the math. Uriah had been off to battle long enough that she knew he could not be the father of this child. She sent word to the king and said, <laughs> King... Sorry to break the news to you. Guess what? You're going to be a father. Hmm. So what does a man after God's own heart do? What does a man who stayed home while his, his armies were out engaged in battle? What does a man do who's walking around on his, his roof and watches a bathing woman and is consumed by lust? What, is a, what does a man do that has taken that woman and brought her into his place and and had his way with her when she sends word that he is going to be a father. He begins to conspire a way to cover his own sin. And how does he do that? He calls in uh, one of his military messengers and he says, tell me about how the, 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 the battle is going and they, they gave him a report. And uh, they said, well, send, send Uriah the Hittite back here to update me. And Uriah the Hittite got the, got the message on the front lines. He came back to Jerusalem. He came into David's presence, present, and he gave a report on the war. 
And David said, thank you for the report. Good job. Now go home. Spend some time with your wife before you go back to the front. You see what David is trying to do. He's trying to cover his own sin. Because in, in his mind, he doesn't know those timelines. He doesn't have all the details that this woman is going to have. He's thinking that if Uriah goes home and is intimate with his wife and goes back to battle and she's discovered to be with child, whenever the delivery date is, there will be a good chance that people will assume that Uriah is the father because he got to spend time with his wife in a reasonable time frame and a window. But what does Uriah do? Uriah goes out and sleeps on the ground in front of the palace with the king's servants. Because in his mind, he says, you know, what right do I have to come back here and be comfortable and spend time with my wife when the armies of Israel are out fighting the battle and they don't have this privilege or this opportunity? <laughs> And, and, and David, you know, that, that, that crawled all over him. So he brings Uriah in, he feeds him, and the scripture says, and he got him drunk. Now we know Uriah had to do his own part, but David encouraged it. David provided the lubrication. David provided the encouragement. David provided the, the words to try to... To, to, to make this happen, thinking if he just gets drunk enough, he's going to forget about his loyalty as a soldier. Uh, he's going to stumble his way home. He's going to find his wife there, and he's going to do what he wants to do. Everything will be taken care of. <laughs> Uriah goes back out, sleeps outside the gate again, and does not go home to his wife. David is beside himself with frustration. And so he calls uh, his military men in. He says, uh, listen, send Uriah back out to battle and put him in the place of greatest risk. And the account says that Uriah went back to the battlefield. He was put out at the front of the, the, the line. And as the enemy overcame them and there was a retreat, he was left out there. And Uriah was killed. Word went back to, to David and said, um, uh, you know, the battle is going well. We've lost one. And, and sorry to tell you, but Uriah died in the battle. And the scripture says, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Keep up the good work. It'll be okay. And then it says that David sent and had Bathsheba brought to his house, and she became his wife. Now, now you and I both know, uh, if, <laughs> if, we're, if we're mature adults, if we've been around the block a few times, that, that David is simply rationalizing his way out of a sense of guilt and responsibility for having done something wrong. So it was bad enough that, that he, he took and had his way with a neighbor's wife who was married. And it should have been enough that he, he used the army of the enemy to kill Uriah because Uriah simply wouldn't be complicit in, in his own cover-up of his own sin. And then when Uriah died in battle, that, that David would look like the big man because he's going to have mercy on the widow of this war hero who died in battle. Give him the bronze star. Give him the silver medal. Give him all those recognitions and that I'm going to take and add his wife to my harem of otherwise so that her needs can be taken care of. And you and I both know that David is simply trying to cover himself and his own sin. <laughs> so fast forward whatever that time frame is to the time of delivery. Bathsheba delivers a son and the son is born sick. And David pleads with God to spare that child's life. Um, he pleads with him. He, he, he doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He's asking God to spare that child's life. And his servants are concerned about him because David is neglecting himself. He's consumed with one thing and and he, he's hoping God is, is, is on his side. After all, he's what? He's a man after God's own heart. Surely God is going to hear his prayer. 
And the account goes that, and the child died. David is in there, hasn't bathed, hasn't eaten. He looks a mess, and he sees the servants whispering to each other. And he says to them, what's going on? Did the child die? It said they were actually afraid to tell him because they said if this is what he does when the child is just sick, you know, what is he going to do if he hears that the child dies? And it says that David got up, washed himself off, went and ate and drank and resumed his life. And he was confronted by that. And, and they asked him, he said, we did, we did, you know, boss, we don't understand. While the child was alive but sick, you know, you went out of your way to plead for God's mercy. But, but when he died, you, you moved on. And, and David said these words that have been taken out of context in a used way. He says, you know, while the child was alive, I didn't know if God was going to spare him or not. He is, he's gone the way of all the earth. I can't bring him back. I can go to him. And so it's like, okay, everything is good. No one's the wiser. And then Nathan the prophet goes into David and he has a nice little parable. He says, King, you've got a problem here. You've got a rich man who has everything in the world and he's got a poor neighbor who has one sheep that he loves. That's his pet. He's named that thing. That animal is, is, is like a child to him. Eats from his table. He's everything to him. And that rich man is going to, he, he's got guests coming in. He needs, to, he needs to feed them. And he doesn't want to take any of his stock and inventory. And so he takes, and he takes the sheep of that poor man that that's the only thing he has. What do you think that ought to be done? And David gets all worked up, all puffed up with anger and says, How dare him do that? That man is going to pay. For what he has done. <laughs> I, I, I love Nathan the prophet. Because Nathan. <laughs> I can only imagine the, the look on his face. The expression on his face. When he looked at David and goes. Dude. You're. That man. Guilty. Everything that, that David had tried to do. To cover his own sin and his own fault and his own guilt, involving other people in that, whether it was Bathsheba, whether it was the men in the military that used to kill Uriah, wh whoever it was in his life that, that did everything that he wanted them to do, his sin was found out. And then we read this in verse 24 of, of chapter 12, that David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and went into her and slept with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved Solomon. You understand why this is a, a perplexing account about grace? I can't, I can't fully explain it other than grace is grace. Other than the fact that none of us deserve any of the goodness of God under any set of circumstances. It's only because of his love that he blesses us with good. <laughs> because we, we certainly don't deserve, we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve any of those kind of things. God chooses to do that. And then our response is what it is to God's grace. And so when I read this, I go, man, you talk about the power of grace. A man who had nothing to gain by his sin. And everything to lose by his sin. Went ahead and did what he wanted to do. As, as though God didn't see. As though God didn't know. As though God didn't care. As though God was going to sign off on what he did. <laughs> hmm. And so the consequences of that, of, of, of that lust was adultery, was lying, was deceit, was manipulation, was murder, was attempted cover-up for all the above. And the child that was born of that union died. Not a punishment on that child. We don't have an explanation 
other than in God's sovereign wisdom, it was the right thing to do. That in light of all of that, this woman who was married to another man who's now the wife of the king, that David goes back into her, and she conceives again. And she has a son. There's no evidence that she had any children before this, which meant that there was a good chance that she and Uriah were, had not been married that long. That God should give them a son and that God should love the son of the married woman and the married king who had committed adultery and that God should love that son who should be called Solomon. You know the rest of the story. When it comes time for David to step down from the throne, when it comes time for David to die and for him to no longer be that man large and in charge, that Solomon was one that God raised up to be the king of Israel. And God blessed him and made him the richest man who ever lived with the greatest wisdom that anyone had possessed. I don't know about you, <laughs> but dude, I am perplexed by that kind of grace. So where does that leave us? We're almost out of time. Where does that leave us? That leaves us that we should not be surprised by things that are perplexing in life. And that figuring out how our faith plays into that, the role other than we have a responsibility to ourselves and the people around us to be holy and godly, and to know that, that, that everything that we do has consequences, that there are potential problems from that. And other people can actually pay for our sin. But here's the perplexity of grace that we simply have to, to, to deal with that we all deserve the worst that God has to offer. And yet because of his love for us in Jesus, he extends to us grace that can cover those sins if we're willing to confess and repent and to get over to him. And in realizing that, that while our children, our families may experience the consequences of our actions, they're not being punished for our sins. They're simply sharing in the consequences of our shame and our sin. I, I suppose the, the challenge for us is to examine our lives. And, you know, we can look at the politicians that are uh, absolute lunatics. We can look at Supreme Court justices that, um, you know, make rulings that, that we don't completely understand. But just realizing this, except except for the grace of God. That could be you, and that could be me. And I guess the final tale is, I, 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 this is a quote I, I look for and I couldn't find. I still think he said it somewhere, that C.H. Spurgeon, in, in explained to somebody that, that struggled with the doctrine of predestination, and we're not gonna go into that, the fact that God determines in advance um, who is going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And, and, and somebody's struggling with how that could be true. And Spurgeon's response was, I'm not, I'm not surprised that God should save some. I'm surprised that God should save any. We should live grace. We should live in grace. But we ought to exhibit the kind of grace that God exhibited in Solomon because of his love for David. Doesn't make it easy to understand. It doesn't make right anything that David did. It means as long as God grants us life and breath, there is hope that he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. So whatever's going on in your life, however bad it may seem, whether you think God is pleased or displeased with you and your life, knowing that any given point when you give it over to him, God can bring good out of evil, not making the evil right or the evil good, but meaning that God is capable of bringing a good, good thing out of a bad thing. And I can celebrate that.
thank you for your time. Hopefully this means something to you. I just had to confess that struggle as, as I read through this and never get away from that. Uh, let me remind you to, to pray for us as we continue to seek opportunities to serve. Um, I'm, I'm planning on being gone next week for a few days, and we're working out the schedule for what we're going to be sharing, what we're going to post. Let me hear from you. I'd like to hear your comments or your reflections or your questions. I'd like for you to please you know, invite others, share the link with them that they can log on and be just as confused as we are about things. I thank you for those that, that continue to support our ministry financially and for the ability we have to, to go and to do and to do these interviews and to seek to help churches. Um, and if you'd like to support our ministry, you can either you know, reach out to me at this email address with your comments or your questions, or if you'd like to know how you can do electronic or online giving, I can assist you with that. Or if you want to simply do it old school and drop a check in the mail, you can make it out to Church Rebirth Ministries, Inc. at this mailing address. We're a 501c3 organization, which means you get a tax deduction as long as the law allows that. Um, in, in the issuer's taxes. So thank you for your, your support. Pray for us. Let us know how we can pray for you. God bless you. Till next week.